1781, and the British hold on the American South is beginning to slip. In the past two years, the British had won three of their largest battles of the war, defeating the American forces at Savannah, and then at Charleston, and then defeating the reinforcing army at the Battle of Camden. The American South was now completely devoid of continental forces. Despite these victories, the British were unable to pacify the colony of South Carolina. The state was embroiled in a civil war between the Loyalists and the Patriots, and the Patriots were definitively winning. Small bands of them roamed the countryside, launching guerrilla attacks on the British, destroying their supply lines, disrupting communications, and wreaking havoc on their morale. The Americans would engage the British in 25 significant skirmishes during these two years, and win all but five of them. In February, in an attempt to disrupt the flow of Patriot reinforcements, the British sent a thousand Loyalists to the border of South Carolina in order to pacify the region. There, a group of a thousand American mounted men ambushed them and destroyed them completely. This would be the Americans' first major victory in the Southern Theater since the British campaign began. Shortly after the victory at Kings Mountain, the Congress elected to send a new army down to South Carolina to try once again to defeat the British and reclaim the region. In February, the American forces under General Greene made it to the colony. He split his army into two groups, and a group led by Daniel Morgan moved into the back country where he would engage the British at the Battle of the Cowpens. This would be a turning point in the war, and perhaps a more significant battle than that of Saratoga. There, the Americans defeated General Tarleston in a stunning victory, inflicting over 80% casualties on his British army. Following the Cowpens, General Cornwallis came to believe that control of the American South could not be maintained without first capturing Virginia. Cornwallis engaged and utterly defeated three separate American armies in the South. Despite his stunning success, he was utterly frustrated by his inability to pacify the region. American victories at Kings Mountain and Cowpens had caused Southern loyalists, which Cornwallis relied upon to bolster the ranks of his army, to stop enlisting or to even defect and head home while at the same time they inspired thousands of new recruits to flock to the American cause. Troops from Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland were continuously streaming south to resist the occupation, and all the while the American professional armies, the Continentals, had come south one after another, seamlessly replacing the armies that Cornwallis had defeated. Cornwallis had once believed they had secured most of the south, but now that picture was disintegrating. The Loyalist upsurge predicted by the British in both South and North Carolina had failed to materialize. Lacking local reinforcements, the British position could be strengthened only by sea from distant New York. The British military presence in the South was now strung out in five bases, and they were all too small to be certain of prevailing in battle, and even one major defeat might be mortal. The only solution was massive reinforcements from the North, but Clinton, cowering in New York, was unwilling to deplete his army there and the British government was unwilling to send troops across the Atlantic. Now, a vigorous Cornwallis decided to disobey his orders and to use his own initiative in a reckless and unexpected gamble. Despairing of help from Quinton, whom he detested, Cornwallis resolved upon an entirely new strategy to charge northward in the, to the rebel heartland of Virginia. The rebel force in the south had been supplied and encouraged from Virginia, and Cornwallis' strategy was to strike across their supply lines and convince the Southern Loyalists that they could safely rise up on the British side. Securing Virginia would effectively cut off Green's army from the north. While Cornwallis is making this decision, an American army is marching towards the Dam River to reinforce Green. Cornwallis decides that the time to move is now, but he will not be able to move to Virginia unopposed. Encamped only a few miles away from his position, the American army under Green is going to desperately try to beat Cornwallis there. The event will come to be known as the Race to the Dam, in reference to the river. Whichever army crosses first will gain a huge advantage in the ability to hold the colony. This is Grim Battaglia, and you're watching my documentary on Battles of the American Revolution. During this time, storms plagued Carolina. They flooded the forests, swelled the rivers, and in some, greatly complicated the whole operation. The armies were oftentimes only a few miles apart from each other, but they would not engage. Each was dead set on making it to the river first. As Green marched, militia flocked from the countryside to join his force. 
and Wallace, on the other hand, would have no such luck. The armies would make it to the river at about the same time and look for a place to cross. Cromwallis was desperate to cross first. He wanted to defeat each of the American armies separately, as he failed to do back in South Carolina. He received word from a spy that the only place to cross the river was about 20 miles west, and so he began to move there with all haste to reach the crossing before Green. Unfortunately for him, there was no other place to cross the river, and Green knew about it. Green and his men crossed the river and raced Cornwallis' army to the next crossing. When Cornwallis finally reached the area, he was dismayed and astonished to see the American army was positioned on the other side, and that they destroyed all available boats. Cornwallis believed that he could have defeated the American army, but his supply lines were overstretched, and so he moved his exhausted and depleted army back into North Carolina to encamp at Hillsborough. General Greene's army now almost doubled the size of Cornwallis's, and he was confident of victory. But he knew that Cornwallis would not attack into hostile territory in Virginia, especially with Cornwallis' supply lines stretched so thin. And so, Greene moved back into the Carolinas and set his trap at Guilford Courthouse, where he hoped to beat Cornwallis into a decisive battle. Greene planned to lay a trap for the British. He put his inexperienced militia at the front line, they'd be protected by a fence and some light forests. On the flanks, he had skirmishers and snipers from the Appalachian Mountains who would pick off British officers from the side and retreat to the forest to wage a guerrilla-style fight against the British. They were protected by light cavalry units to keep them from being quickly enveloped. The first line was ordered to fire only two shots before retreating. They'd then fall back and rejoin the second line, which was more experienced militia. These militia would fight in a thick forest, a condition that favored the Americans' guerrilla-style tactics. Finally, the British would reach the third line, with the skilled Continental Army would be ready to fight the exhausted British. While this plan superficially resembles the plan used by General Morgan at Cowpens, it had one significant difference, and that was that the troops were spaced out far enough that they couldn't support each other during the battle. This meant when the first line was engaged by the British, the second line would be unable to give support. The British observed the American position. It was the Americans' hope that the British would march straight down the road so that they could be attacked from the forest by the Brit Americans on each side. But Cornwallis was a skilled general, and he predicted a trap might be afoot. So he put the majority of his army on the left side of the road, which had light forests and offered more protection from artillery and skirmishers. He would order them to advance forward on the inexperienced militia and hopefully break them with ease. Cornwallis was a skilled general and didn't want to attack the Americans without first scouting their position. He sent forward his cavalry to harass the American advanced cavalry and scout the position. The American cavalry briefly resisted but was driven back when they saw British reinforcements arriving. The cavalry observed that the right side of the road was fairly defended and open while the left side of the road had forced and would offer natural protection against American skirmishers and artillery barrages. Cornwallis was aware that the Americans had nearly 3,000 militiamen and 1,500 Continentals. With a total of 4,500 troops, they doubled the size of Cornwallis' army, which comprised just under 2,000 infantry and cavalry. Despite this, Cornwallis decided to attack. He opened the day with an artillery barrage on the Americans' forward artillery position, but this was largely ineffectual. He then ordered that his men advance in single formation on the Americans' defensive position. As they approached the Americans' front ranks, the Americans opened a deadly line of fire, using the fence to steady their guns for precise aim. The barrage was devastating, and according to one British officer present, one half of the Highlanders dropped dead on the spot. The British bravely continued marching forward, and coming into the chosen range of their own guns, loosed off a volley on the Americans before charging with their bayonets. The 1,000 North Carolina militia fled in a wild panic. This could hardly have surprised Green, who instructed them to withdraw after losing only three volleys. One American officer reported that every effort was made to stop this unaccountable panic, for not a man of the corpse had been killed or even wounded. All was in vain, and so thoroughly confounded for these unhappy men that throwing away their arms, knapsacks, and even canteens, they rushed like a torrent headlong through the forest. Meanwhile, on the right, 
the Americans threw up a stiffer resistance before being forced back into the woods. General Lee and his cavalry would fight a guerrilla style resistance against the British right flank. The British then pushed forward down the center and forced the Americans to fall back to their second position. Charging forward after the first militia route, the British found themselves caught in the first stage of the trap. On either side, riflemen opened up from the shelter of the trees, while the second American line fired at them from ahead. The thick undergrowth made proper bayonet attack impossible, and with discipline and courage under fire, the British troops regrouped detachments on either side to pursue the snipers, while the main body moved forward yet again. The American trap was effective, and they inflicted major casualties on the British. Cornwallis's horse was even shot out from underneath him, and he was just able to avoid being captured by the Virginia militia when a British sergeant rushed to his aid. Astonishingly though, in the Maywind undergrowth, whose cover favored the Americans, the British pushed forward and upward, and were able to push the Americans out into the clearing before Guilford Courthouse. They were certain that they had won. Meanwhile, on the right, the Americans of Ruby continued putting up their stiff resistance in the forest, although they were slowly being pushed back by the British. In the center, Charleston's cavalry captured the American artillery and turned it with Ray Bush, who was still holding the line. This was too much, and they were forced from the battlefield, opening the American center. The British defeated the American militia after a fierce battle and pushed forward, surely believing that the battle had been won. When they reached the rail fence, they were astonished to see the third line of American Continental standing before them. They stopped in order to regroup, reform, and catch their breath. Had Green ordered a full melee charge into the British at this moment, it's highly likely the entire force would have routed. They were exhausted from the fierce battle with the first two American lines and already suffered heavy casualties. But hindsight was 2020. On the left, the British troops continued to battle the American militia snipers, and they were able to force them from the field. But the cavalry held firm, tying down those forces. Meanwhile, on the right, the British continued to fight against Lee's troops. Lee's men were holding strong, using the force for protection and keeping the British right tied down. The British then advanced towards the center, moving their artillery down the road, keeping pace with their infantry. They observed a gap between the American lines, rushed forward with their cavalry and Hessian infantry, surrounding the Americans and dividing their force in two. The American troops fought back but they were forced to retreat. They were able to regain order though and reform their lines further down the field. The British troops there opted to move in pursuit of the Americans rather than flanking Green's main army, because to do so, they would have had to expose their own rears to the Americans. The British infantry on the left, broken by the American cavalry, and Green then gave the order for his infantry to advance into the forest and engage the British. The two forces entered into a fierce battle. Both sides were holding firm, but the American cavalry from the left was now free, and they moved forward and struck the British rear. Seeing that his men were faltering, Cornwallis decided he had to make a gamble. He moved towards the road and ordered his cannons turned towards the forest. In the fierce forest fighting, it would be impossible to avoid friendly fire if the cannons were used to support the British troops. Nevertheless, the cannons were loaded with caster shot and unleashed a devastating barrage into the forest, killing British and American soldiers alike. The gamble paid off. The American lines were shocked by the sudden barrage, and they broke and began to flee, with the cavalry moving to protect the retreat. Seeing what was unfolding, Green gave the order for his men to retreat, hoping to maintain order rather than facing a full rout. They withdrew from the battlefield, and the British cavalry attempted to make a pursuit, but realizing that the troops on the right were still engaging the Americans, they quickly abandoned the effort and rode to the aid of their allies. Lacking both food and shelter, the British spread out through the wooded countryside and encamped for the night. A torrential downpour would come that would kill 50 of the wounded men. Had the British pursued the fleeing Americans, they likely would have found and captured the American baggage train. They declined to pursue since they didn't want to chase the Americans into the Carolina backcountry and risk being attacked by swarms of American militiamen. Green, who wished to avoid another Camden, kept his army intact and led an orderly retreat from the battle. The Americans had lost 79 killed, 185 wounded, and 1,046 missing, presumably mostly militiamen who returned to their homes after the battle. The British, meanwhile, lost 93 men, 408 wounded, and 25 captured. Additionally, they lost those 50 
during the night to the torrential downpour. Of those wounded, 24 were British officers, and three of officers would be counted amongst the killed. In this one battle, the British had lost a quarter of their fighting force. The British engaged an American army twice their size. The British were used to fighting with superior numbers and they engaged with the typical bravery and tenacity that defined Cornwallis' leadership. However, this caused them to take significant casualties. The battle would be recorded as a victory for the British, but it was a furic one and it amounted to an American strategic victory. In Parliament, party members who opposed the war announced that another such victory would ruin the British army. While at the moment the British appeared to be in complete control of the South, they would soon be forced to retreat and surrender it completely to the Americans. Cornwallis held in North Carolina for around three weeks before deciding to withdraw to the coast and encamp at Wilmington in order to resupply his army. Cornwallis was ordered by Clinton to maintain control of the Carolinas in the South, but Cornwallis would disobey commands. He learned that Arnold was leading raids in Virginia and that they were having a heavy effect on the troops therein. He believed they could not maintain control of the South unless Virginia was first pacified. He packed his army and headed north. Clinton wrote to Cornwallis sharply criticizing him, but Cornwallis was undeterred. As he marched north, he burned and raided every farm or plantation that he passed through. He was able to convert 700 of his infantry into cavalry with the stolen horses and freed thousands of slaves, 12,000 of whom would join his army. Nathaniel Green set off in April towards Camden, hoping to draw Cornwallis back into the Carolinas. Francis Rawdon protected Camden with 1,500 men. Green's army was now severely depleted as his militia dispersed and he had only a small advantage in regular soldiers over the British when he arrived at the fortified town. He encamped outside for a few days on Hopkirk's Hill and he presented a tempting prospect to Rawdon, who marched forward with 800 men on the 25th of April. Again, the British were at a disadvantage, attacking up a hill. Green sent two regiments down to meet them, while the American cavalry galloped to surprise the British rear. But Rawdon was unfazed and continued to advance. The Marylanders panicked and fled, inducing the nearby Virginia militia to retreat as well. With only the unreliable North Carolina militia in reserve to plug the gap, Green wisely chose not to proceed, retreating with the enemy in full pursuit for two miles. Neither side had suffered heavy casualties, but the British had gained the field again. Rawdon decided to withdraw from his exposed position in Camden, and he ordered Colonel John Kruger to do the same from his exposed position at Fort 96. Green tried to encircle this with a force double the size, but he was forced to abandon the siege as Rawdon came in pursuit. With Green in retreat, Rawdon resumed his retreat back to the coast, and the Americans effectively captured the fort. Meanwhile, the Swamp Fox, Francis Marion, struck out. He defeated the garrisons at Fort Watson and at Fort Motte, claiming them for the Americans, effectively giving control of all of South Carolina back to the American cause. Making a sortie, the British forces were then surprised at Utah Springs. The British, buoyed that the Americans were still in their summer quarters, and they hastily formed their lines outside the camp as Green attacked in three columns, the militia, out in front this time. Soon, they had broken through the British lines and were in their camp, where many turned to looting, particularly indulging the rum that they found. But the British launched a counterattack, which drove out the disorganized and tipsy Americans. It would have been a rout had not a number of Maryland regulars defied the British advance. The American surprise attack had gone sour, narrowly turning into a British victory, with losses even on each side. Rawdon then took his forces and retreated back to South Carolina. In spite of these victories, the British attempts to secure the South were over. The British had won virtually every significant engagement except the battles of Kings Mountain and Cowpens, but now they lost the campaign because the Loyalists would not rally them as expected. The British could never convince the populations of North and South Carolina that they had any prospect of controlling the whole territory, so that they would stay there and the cow local population was not prepared to take the risk of joining them, only to suffer American reprisals later on. It's said that during the campaign, Green's slogan was we fight, get beat, rise, and fight again, perfectly summarizing the story of his campaign in the South.
In just over a year, General Greene had done what the two American commanders before him had failed to do, retaking control of the South. Now, the sole hope for the British rests on Cornwallis' campaign to gain control of Virginia and cut off Greene's army from resupplies. Join us next week as we follow the raids of Bandit Arnold throughout Virginia and we watch as Cornwallis tries to execute his desperate last strategy to win the war for the British. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, comment, or subscribe. And as always, I hope you enjoyed this, and please never stop learning.